everybody settle in? <laughs> okay. Uh, coming, Marco. Thank you for coming back. Now we have a dual talk, if you will. Uh, we're supposed to be three of them, but Slobodan couldn't make it. He's sick, as I'm told, right? Yes. Yeah, so you will have Boris uh, and uh, Miroslav with you today to talk about this topic. Uh, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Miroslav and I'm team manager and Java developer in United Cloud. Uh, I'm Boris and I'm working as DevOps engineer in United Cloud. Okay, so we are United Cloud. So uh, I guess that most of Balkan people here heard about Eon TV as our starting platform. And uh, yes, it is a, a video streaming platform that serves uh, live content, uh, VOD content, catch up and stuff like that uh, on multiple CDNs uh, worldwide. It's on-premise installations. So we recently reached some really huge uh, amount of traffic and really big, uh, big uh, numbers. And we're running on millions of devices uh, worldwide. So, uh, but we're more than that now. So we started as a bunch of enthusiasts gathered around the TV platform. But today we have 10 product clients that uh, regional leader of uh, telco and media industry are using. Okay, and as Miroslav already said, as everything else we built in United Cloud, our infrastructure too is built in-house and hosted on-premises. And since we are big believers in open source products and community, we decided to use open source products as core components and building blocks for our infrastructure. Uh, when you have a large distributed system, you want to have ability to easily uh, automate, maintain, and troubleshoot uh, your infrastructure, your system. So that's the reason why we're trying to keep our infrastructure as simple as possible. And as you can see on this picture here, uh, we are running Nginx and HAProxy as core services on our edge infrastructure. And these services are basically acting as an entry point to the entire uh, Eon TV ecosystem. And now one thing that you probably already know, unfortunately, outages are not a question of if, but when. So we had uh, this premise in mind while we were designing Eon TV infrastructure and uh, we set some goals that our infrastructure should met in order to address this fact. So first and most important thing is that uh, we want to hide any outages from our, uh, of our downstream services from our clients. So no matter what happens with our backend services, our end users should not be affected. Also, uh, we want to provide a better quality of service for our uh, end users and we want to have uh, zero downtime for operational tasks like uh, software updates, hardware upgrades, uh, planned maintenance and stuff like that. And we want to uh, have support to experiment with different types of, with different rollout strategies like Canary or Blue and Green. And since our, if we are talking about edge infrastructure, it's, it's entry point to our ecosystem, so we want to have as much as possible metrics from that point of our system. And now, all of these things may sound like, like basic stuff, and they, they really are basic stuff, and if we were running our infrastructure at some cloud provider, we would probably get all of this out of the box. So, now I will try to explain why we didn't run our infrastructure uh, at some cloud provider, why we chose to use on-premises deployment. We already had that question down. Okay, so uh, here you can see a uh, coverage map. So basically, uh, we are covering uh, these regions with Eon TV uh, services. And uh, I was talking about quality of service. And general idea of, with quality of service is that you want to put your content as closest as possible to your end user. With if, if we were running on some cloud provider, we would be limited in that sense. So in all of these countries, we have uh, multiple points of presence. So for example, if you are requesting some video stream for, from Belgrade, there are great chances that you will hit the server, which is like a few kilometers away from you. Um, also, uh, second uh, big, s second important reason why we decided to use on-premises uh, installations is simply because of performance. So uh, video encoding and, st and streaming are uh, really compute intensive tasks. So we want to run our services 
on on best thing that 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 that, that hardware can offer. So how we do that? Well, everything starts with with choosing your 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 machine, your server. So we are not using like off the shelf stuff. We are uh, we are using uh, highly customized servers just for our use case. And on top of that, we are adding some really low level optimizations, like for example, uh, CPU frequency and scheduling policies configuration and different uh, memory and networking stack optimizations. And you can you can really do that stuff only if you have access to 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 to, to, to hardware. Also, as you can see here, at the peak time, we are serving around 215,000 HTTP requests per second. So that means a lot of TLS terminations and a lot of encryption. And that's, that's, that's also really expensive stuff. So nowadays, we are experimenting with, uh, with, 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 with new types of hardware, with, with, with network interface cards that can actually offload uh, old TLS and encryption stuff from CPU. So we are literally, we, we literally can have a network interface card, which will do all the uh, TLS and encryption stuff for, for, for us. So we will have uh, better latency, better response time. We will have, uh, we will have uh, a lot better uh, CPU utilizations on our servers. Those were some technical things. There are some non-technical things why we are using on-premises installations and that our customers are mainly telco, uh, telco operators. So th th those are companies that, that have their TV studios, they're even producing the content and common use case for us is that we need uh, literally physical connection between some TV studio and, and our uh, server that are doing video encoding. So. I'm not sure how Google would react it if we ask them, if, if we ask them, can we plug in our cable into your server? I, I doubt we, we, we would get like affirmative response. Uh, so uh, that's it. I think I I I managed to I, I managed to, to 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 introduce our infrastructure and the reason why we are on premises. And now I will let my colleague Miroslav to walk you through what's running behind that infrastructure. Thank you, Boris. So my background here is an uh, uh, application that we call the InfoService. So this is a backend service that uh, provides APIs that uh, our client applications are using, you know, on mobile devices, STBs, web platforms, and stuff like that. Uh, so we are responsible uh, for that our users get the right content for them. Uh, we are responsible for maintaining their subscriptions, for stuff like uh, personalizations, etc. So, uh, as Boris already mentioned, so it's really uh, high traffic. So we are uh, serving a really uh, big amount of uh, requests, and uh, we need to serve them fast. So uh, we uh, have need uh, to uh, to use a caching system. So for that purpose, we uh, mostly used uh, Apache Ignite as a distributed cache system. Uh, so. Uh, Boris already mentioned, so uh, we are on-premise installations, so we are uh, uh, divided into multiple different locations, uh, and uh, each of those locations forms one cluster. So uh, our deployment process looks like, like something like this. So uh, we uh, shut down the traffic from, uh, from one cluster, and then do our installation, and uh, check if everything is fine, and uh, proceed further. So this process uh, was mostly done by developers, and it lasted like, 15 to 20 minutes per cluster. So now uh, this talk is about uh, how we sleep safely and soundly and everything is fine, but if you take a look into my pale face and bags under my eyes, you can tell that I'm probably lying. But uh, trust me, my little kid is re responsible for this and I'm sure that Boris can relate with very, very similar problems <laughs> here too. Uh, but you know, uh, in UC, uh, that wasn't always the case to you know sleep well and uh, safely and soundly. So imagine a service like Eon TV starting to work like six years ago, and uh, many challenges uh, started to come. And those challenges were like big events, uh, World Cup, Eurobasket, stuff like that. And many users started to to uh, come at, at the same time into into our application, and uh, everything was really really nearly crashing. But we somehow managed to survive that, and we learned a lot from that. And 
we had quite a long phase that we did our deployments, you know, the stuff that I described before, we did it nightly. So we did it, you know, by night and uh, yeah, because you know, we need to, to be present 24 seven, nothing should, uh, should crash. And we reached some stable state after, after a few, few months. So hopefully, okay, we moved to, to uh, early morning deploys. We were happy and everything worked uh, like perfect for, uh, for almost a year. So uh, we uh, deployed uh, new versions after each sprint. And once we skipped actually uh, one sprint, it was uh, May holidays, you know, spring holidays, stuff like that. And now we had four week, uh, four week job to, uh, to deploy. And uh, uh, how we did that? So we, uh, back then we had three CDNs, three different CDNs. And the first two, we had a uh, smaller amount of users, smaller traffic. So we did that on the first day and everything was fine. Everything was cool. So uh, we were safe to go uh, tomorrow with uh, our biggest uh, CDN, with, uh, with the highest traffic and with all those numbers that Boris mentioned. So we started that cluster by cluster. Everything looked fine. Uh, we get, I guess, uh, until the, the half of, uh, of uh, the deploy, until bam, uh, everything was started to crash. Uh, Boris here and DevOps crew uh, noticed some problem. We uh, took a look into Grafana and we saw something like this. So we experienced memory leak and uh, uh, we alarmed our entire team and uh, everybody was uh, just uh, need needed to, to do really fast so we could revert to previous uh, version and to recover from it. And uh, we were like a few minutes uh, before total crash. We survived, but how did that happen? What was, uh, what was the problem? Uh, we took a hip dump and uh, we tried to, to see what actually caused uh, that problem. And we easily saw that there are uh, a lot of objects uh, of concrete hash maps uh, generating, which contained some Ignite query with the logic that uh, uh, hasn't been changed for uh, like three years. So problem shouldn't be there. And we started digging deeper and we saw that at the very beginning of that four week period, we upgraded version of Apache Ignite library to a newer one. So that was, that was our clue, but you know, uh, that, uh, uh, that upgrade was a part of uh, one really long living branch that actually existed for like three months, stuff like that. So we even forgot when we, when we deployed it. And uh, most importantly, it was sitting on our test environment for like a month and we haven't noticed any problem. So how we ended here? What, uh, what brought us to, to, to that problem after these uh, stable months? Uh, why our, uh, our uh, performance test that we, we had and we ran on our test machines didn't catch uh, the problem? Was something bad in our deploy process? Could we, could, could we do it uh, any better? So also, uh, could we have some more metrics exposed so we can actually see that, uh, that uh, usage of memory was increasing even before this heap dump? Uh, uh, even before we, 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 uh, we, we took a look into heap dump. And um, yeah, we had too many changes in one deploy and we, we had really, really hard time to, to find what, what caused us this, uh, this problem. So after this, uh, this revert, uh, we sat down and, see, uh, and needed to see uh, how to correct this behavior and how to, to prevent uh, us from uh, this to happen again. And first, an obvious clue was, okay, we needed real traffic for our performance test to reproduce this problem. So what we did, we took uh, Tomcat access logs from uh, highest peak of usage from one of our uh, uh, production servers, and we reproduced the uh, get requests uh, from there to, to our test environment. And we managed to reproduce the problem, uh, the memory leak problem uh, on, uh, our, on our test environment. So, okay, we were happy. And now we reverted version of Apache Ignite and we ran the same test and everything was cool. So we haven't upgraded Apache Ignite uh, ever, ever since. But, uh, <laughs> but what we are doing actually uh, is that uh, this kind of performance testing is now our routine process whenever we want to uh, do some changes on our current APIs or do some larger refactoring or even introducing new services and stuff like that. So we need to measure and compare results uh, with the previous one in order to see if our change is good to go. Similar to that, we use uh, uh, something called traffic mirroring, uh, which actually mimic uh, uh, live traffic from one uh, server to another, like test server. 
so we could uh, uh, catch some weird behavior before our end users uh, uh, face it. Yes, and even though uh, performance test and traffic mirroring and traffic replying are great things and they can really reveal uh, issue before you even put your uh, new, version, new version of your code into production, it would be even better to let some small portion of real production users to use real production newly updated servers. So for that reason, uh, we stick with uh, Canary deployment. Our infrastructure, mainly Nginx and HAProx, is supported this, this, kind of this kind of deployment from day one, so they, they supported the header-based routing. And what we did, uh, we uh, added support in our uh, backend services, so we have ability to uh, add uh, our users to something we internally called Canary Group. When some user is part of Canary Group, it will, stand, it will start sending uh, some additional headers uh, in, in each HTTP request, so we'll basically our infrastructure will know where to route, uh, where to route uh, that request. So if you inspect Eon TV and if you see something like XUCP Canary, uh, XUCP routing header, then you're probably Canary user. Uh, okay, yes, one, one more important thing is uh, that uh, both um, managing Canary servers and Canary users, both of, those, both of those tasks are fully automated, so our developers can on-demand manage both the servers and the users. So they, they do not have to send a, uh, mails or uh, create a Jira ticket or, st or stuff like that. And, uh, okay, we can go next. Yes, and um, next is important thing that we didn't have was proper monitoring and alerting. We actually have monitoring and alerting and we had a lot of metrics, but we have a lot of system metrics. So we had like CPU, memory, IO, um, I don't know, we got a point. So we didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, 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 metrics from our application. So the reason why we didn't have metrics for our application was simply because our infrastructure back then didn't support easy integration for our uh, developers to expose their metrics. We didn't use Prometheus. The reason why we didn't use Prometheus was that when we started building Eon, that was like six, seven years ago, Prometheus was back then was really young product and we, 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 we decided to stick with some more mature products. And when we migrated to Prometheus, uh, well, we migrated to Prometheus for two reasons. First one was to anticipate migrating to Kubernetes and uh, microservices architecture. And next was obvious to allow our developers to expose their metrics without, ne without need, to, to, without, uh, without need to, to get support from some other team. So some, some, something happened then. When they, when, they, when they was able to expose their metrics, they expose like, like tons of metrics and they wanted to have alert rule for, for, for all of metrics. And DevOps team was literally overwhelmed with those, with those requests. And then we say, okay, let we, can we create something so developers can by themselves create the alerting rules and push that rules to production. And yeah, we created some pipeline. We had like basically GitOps approach. We had some Git repository. They had their alert, alerts. Uh, GitLab triggers some pipeline and we deploy our alerts to, to our products, to, our, to all of our environments. So, okay, we get, our, we get our alerting rules, but when you take a look at our Slack channels back then, we had like complete mess. So Java guys would create alert names in camel case. Python guys would use snake case. It, it, was, it was complete mess. We had like different labels for the, for the same thing, uh, different, uh, severity levels. It was like literally complete mess. So we decided to iterate once more and we improved our pipeline. We defined some uh, style guide, how our uh, alerting names should look like, uh, what are some mandatory labels and stuff like that. And we created simple tool to, to, to check all of these. And now we are in a situation that uh, we have properly configured uh, alerting rules and routing policies so developers can by themselves uh, create their rules and their routing and uh, both alerting rules and routing rules so they can say okay I want the for this alert to be sent on on this slack channel and we have like 
a lot less noisy situation right now. And you heard me a few times today that I, s I have said, like, our developers can do on demand this or that. Well, that's the general idea of self-service. So we, we want to let someone to do something by themselves, so without sending a mail, creating a Jira ticket, pinging someone on Slack. This system brings uh, a lot of benefits, like fewer, fewer uh, bottlenecks and context switches. Like we have now, we have more time to do actual productive work. We have faster time to response and faster time to delivery. And maybe uh, most important thing is that we have reduced risk. I don't know how many times we crashed our Prometheus server because someone had some typo in PromQL expression. So now when we have, when everything goes through, through pipeline, we are do all the verification and we are 100% sure that everything will work down the line. And as a result of all of these things, we have like just more efficient uh, business process. And those are a few things we did on our side. Now, Miroslav will talk more about what they did on development side. Okay, so Merge Hell, I uh, guess you're familiar with the term. So, and when you take a look into, into this picture, you can imagine maybe uh, a lot of branches from uh, each developer uh, doing uh, something on their own and it lasts for, you know, weeks. So, uh, it can get really messy. So, imagine you have, uh, you have your branch that you maintain and push something uh, for a week or two or even more, and you need to merge it. So, yeah, it's, uh, it can be tricky with uh, co uh, co every conflict that you need to resolve. And okay, you resolve the conflict, you merge it. What will happen then? So, uh, is it uh, really ready to, to be deployed somewhere? So, uh, will everything break? And imagine this, so if it, uh, it don't break then, but it breaks uh, for four weeks later, like like we did. So, what to do? What? Uh, how to prevent this? So there are people uh, who are advocating trunk-based development, and they are saying, okay, so if you integrate often, preferred on daily basis, uh, or even or even more more than that, you will not have uh, problems like this. But does this really work? To me, it sounded like utopia. I mean, you know, we we all. Uh, you know, me and my colleagues, we came from Gitflow uh, era and uh, this, this sounded like almost impossible. But we believed in CI, CD and we believed that we wanted to, to get there and uh, decided to give it a try. But, of course, it wasn't that easy. So, we had quite a lot of obstacles and our first obstacle uh, in info service application was uh, that our pipelines lasted forever. So, uh, with forever, I mean that uh, pipeline that we had, uh, like pre-merge pipeline that we use uh, before we merge into, into main, uh, lasted uh, uh, for an hour. And uh, that's, uh, that's not uh, all. Uh, it couldn't be run in parallel. So, uh, we had three teams. Uh, we still have three teams that uh, that are working on the same uh, on, on the same uh, pieces of code. And imagine uh, your your code is ready uh, to to be merged. You want to uh, to merge, and you see that your pipeline is waiting in a queue after three or four different uh, pipelines, and you know that you will not be able to merge that often. Uh, so uh, you you will not merge that day, uh, definitely. And uh, besides that problem, if you want to do trunk-based development. Uh, we had a lot of questions uh, how to de deal with code review. Is it really expected that uh, everybody will do code reviews uh, each day so you can easily integrate your code into Trunk so you know, everybody stop their work uh, and uh, see what I did. And imagine if you're uh, agile enough so you can uh, have uh, that amount of small stories uh, that you can actually finish in a day or two if you do subtasking or stuff like that. What about really big features that cannot be ready to, to be uh, deployed somewhere uh, that soon? Or even big refactoring that uh, for sure cannot be ready to, to be deployed uh, that soon. So uh, with all those problems in mind, we started uh, working on them and to see how, how we, can, uh, we can cope with that in parallel. So. Uh, the most painful stuff was, of course, our pipelines. So, what we did, we uh, first did some standardization of uh, how we want our pipelines to look, so we could see uh, where we have uh, our bottlenecks. So, 
basically we have pre-merged pipeline that uh, uh, execute uh, all the tests needed and uh, run a quality gate in our case on a sonar cube to see if we are ready to merge if uh, uh, we get to the merge point uh, after that we are uh, uh, building a, a docker image deploy it somewhere and when we deploy it somewhere uh, we do uh, some portion of uh, smoke test and see if, uh, if everything is fine and uh, uh, the most painful stuff for us was uh, uh, testing stage because we had quite a lot of integration tests back then that uh, took uh, forever to execute because uh, they uh, did the writing into database, uh, then persisting data into uh, cache, Apache Ignite, and then checking the logic. Uh, by just splitting those tests into two phases, just checking if persistence with Ignite works well and check if the logic works well, uh, we uh, reduced the amount of executing tests by 35 minutes. And uh, with that in mind, and when we reduced uh, work uh, uh, that uh, database needed to do, uh, we actually were able to uh, use a, a container for our database. So each pipeline runs uh, its uh, own database. So we could actually run our uh, pipelines uh, in parallel. So we could be faster. So now we can integrate often. We can merge in a day. But code review. So how we are doing uh, uh, a code review. Yes, we, we, we are doing, we are not, uh, we, we didn't ditch co code review process at all, but uh, is it really a gate for, for merging? Should we necessarily uh, wait uh, uh, for someone to take a look into our code? Before uh, our changes, we had the rule that we need two approvers that, uh, ne uh, that need to take a look into your code and uh, uh, to approve it before you merge. But we decided to go faster than that okay if your pipeline uh, is fine it is green and we know that it will be deployed on some test environment it, it will be uh, used uh, there and uh, some uh, test suite will be will be run there then you get feedback from your code immediately so uh, we don't wait for that merge but we advise that that uh, code review happens of course at some point of time so uh, in uh, case of my team uh, we uh, do it uh, m mostly uh, early in the morning so we check what we merged uh, uh, yesterday into main branch and the worst, worst case scenario for a developer is that uh, uh, if uh, something is uh, very wrong then you just revert that one squashed commit that you that you pushed yesterday and it's really uh, less painful than revert uh, for weeks job and um, Second uh, approach that we are experimenting is actually doing code review on the fly. So if you're doing pair programming or mob programming, your peers are there. They're uh, constantly, uh, you know, you, you do your code together uh, and uh, code review is not really needed. And uh, what about big features and big refactorings? So I guess you heard about the feature toggle or feature flag. So uh, basically the idea is hide your functionality until it's ready. So you do the development, uh, create some property, hide your code uh, behind that property uh, until you think uh, it is ready. So uh, of course you will be wrong at some point, you will think it is ready, you will turn it on in, into production, but then you can easily just switch it off. So you don't need to do revert on previous versions like, like, like we did. Even further, we advise this for even smaller features uh, to, be, to be done in this way. We call it development feature toggle. So whenever you can, just uh, we, hi we are hiding, uh, we are hiding what, what we are adding until, uh, what we are writing until we think it is ready. And then uh, uh, we just uh, delete uh, the, the, the old functionality, delete the, the, the part uh, after if. So uh, those were some, some processes that we incorporated uh, uh, right now, so uh, that we are doing and we strongly believe in. But uh, as we are constantly seeking for improvements, there are quite a few things that we are uh, uh, currently trying to, uh, to incorporate. So uh, when you're doing your development and uh, trust us, we have uh, strong quality gates, at least in, in, in my team, so you need to write tests, but when you do development, and you think you're thinking about design of your code, about all the patterns that, that you need to satisfy, and uh, you write all those code, and uh, then you need to write test. Chances that you will miss something are bigger. So 
if you don't want to think about TDD, if it is too heavy to you, uh, there is an uh, approach called uh, acceptance test driven development and small portion of it that we are trying to do is that entire team sits down before uh, we start working on some user story. So we create a checklist to prepare which kind of test do we need to satisfy all the scenarios that we want and if that this uh, list is checked, we are good to go. And uh, not just in process side, we started uh, doing uh, some improvements on uh, architectural and infrastructural side by introducing uh, microservice, by splitting uh, this uh, monolithic application to microservices. And uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we decrease the impact on, uh, on uh, production and we improved our deploy processes there. Yes, but you have increased impact on us. <laughs> so now you probably realize that Nginx and HA proxy could not uh, drive the such dynamic workload uh, that microservices brings in. So we decided to go with Kubernetes on the edge. So the, uh, the idea is to uh, replace, the idea is basically, well, to, to run Kubernetes clusters or even full-blown clusters or standalone clusters on our edge services. But we want to, we want to keep some, some things that we are having now. For example, now if a user requests a service A and it lands on some server in, 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 in our CDN. And if uh, that server does not have any health instance of service A in its location, that Nginx or HA proxy can uh, proxy that request to, to the next uh, closest cluster. So by default, with Kubernetes, we cannot do something like that because Kubernetes is one big isolated island. So we have to interconnect all of our clusters somehow. And we will do that by uh, setting up some service, uh, some global service mesh. So, so basically, all entire our edge infrastructure will be part of 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 of, of global uh, of global like private network. So, and yes, and I hope that this time next year we'll be talking about how we serve on TV uh, customers from Kubernetes on Edge. So that's it, guys. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, I hope that you find our uh, talk uh, insightful. So uh, for uh, exchanging ideas or for any questions, you can find us at UC Boot. Yes, and if you like uh, Treasure Hunt, you can scan this QR code and you can play a game with us. And uh, yes, thanks one again for anticipating. I hope that you have enjoyed our presentation. And see you soon. See you.